first uh, what's new in series for 2021 and appropriately it is titled um, what's new in 2021 and beyond and just before i turn it over to our host dr paul wheatley price we will uh we will um just a couple of housekeeping notes um happy new year to everyone who i have not had a chance to greet but uh and today we are uh look taking a look at 2021 and beyond and we have the very pioneer of uh, lung cancer research research in Canada and indeed in the world, Dr. Frances Shepard with us. And uh, she is, uh, is an Order of Canada winner and is known to many of us as a very forward thinking leader in research as well as uh, women's rights in, um, in, uh, in, in the science and medical sphere. We, uh, in, in this, in the, within this webinar, we will be, it will be uh, 45 minutes of discussion between Dr. Wheatley Price as well as Dr. Shepard followed by a question and answer session. If you have a question, please type it into the chat or email it to info at lungcancercanada.ca. I promise we will try to get to all of your questions um, at the end, and we've left 15 minutes at the end of this uh, session for questions. And uh, without further ado, I will now turn it over to Dr. Wheatley Price. Great, thank you, Christina, and welcome everyone. This is our third What's New in Lung Cancer webinar. Uh, hosted by Lung Cancer Canada. I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Ottawa and currently serve as president of Lung Cancer Canada and moderate these sessions, which is fun because I get to talk to some of the um, you know, smartest um, uh, clinicians in lung cancer uh, really in the world. So um, the first one was about EGFR lung cancer. We had Professor Tony Mock from Hong Kong and Dr. Barb Miloski from Vancouver. Um, and then the second one with Dr. Ross Camage from Colorado and Dr. Natasha Lale from Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto. You can access both of those on the Lung Cancer Canada website. That's lungcancercanada.ca. Uh, if you've been looking at this one, you may have seen that there were going to be uh, two physicians joining me, Dr. Shepard and also Dr. Scott Laurie. He's not available um, uh, today, unfortunately. So um, we'll miss his insight. Uh, but having said that, uh, Dr. Shepard was uh, my mentor when I first moved to Canada and really is a uh, probably not too, um, too going too far wrong to say an, an icon in lung cancer in uh, Canada and, and indeed globally um, and a leader in women in, in medicine. And in fact, just over my shoulder, this is my wall of historical heroes that I have in my office and just over my ear there, that's Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who was the first female physician um, in, in the UK and in the US, uh, in North America. She got a medical degree in the mid 1800s and um, she was actually from my hometown of Bristol. Um, I'm not that old. <laughs> so we'll, be ha we'll have a fairly informal discussion and we are going to talk about uh, exciting things that are coming in lung cancer. We're not gonna dwell too much on the advances of recent years, We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit just to provide some context. But then I really want to hear from Dr. Shepard uh, where she sees lung cancer going uh, this year and indeed in years to come. So you've heard Order of Canada, Order of Ontario, uh, the Canada Gardner Whiteman Award, uh, Professor of Medicine. Um, anything I'm missing out? It's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Welcome to the webinar. Um, maybe first I could just ask you, just before we get on to the future, just maybe you, you, you've been, you know, the leader in many changes in lung cancer over the past um, few decades. What, what would you say are the biggest, uh, the biggest advances that you've seen um, uh, in your career or in, in recent years in lung cancer that's made things better for people who might be listening? I think what has made the greatest change uh, in the last decade and what's made it so exciting for us as clinicians and researchers has been the change in technology. When I started, we were not doing any molecular profiling at all as a routine test. We knew about some of the genetic abnormalities that were associated with lung cancer. 
we could only do genetic testing on fresh or snap frozen tissue. And we did it one gene at a time. And you had to have large amounts of tissue. So basically we had to have huge reject uh, resection specimens to do this. Move forward 40 years, and we now can take blood samples and test hundreds, if not thousands, of genes. And we can look at the expression of those genes. Like, are those genes expressed more in cancer tissues compared to regular tissues? And that can be associated with the malignant phenotype. But more importantly, we've been able to look at mutations in those genes. And that's what's driven a lot of our treatment strategies forward and changed our treatment strategies, allowing us to give what we call personalized medicine for a subgroup, and sadly, it's far from all. It's far, far from all, and it's mainly in the adenocarcinoma subgroup, but in that subgroup of lung cancer, which accounts for maybe 40 or 50% of lung cancer, at least, um, there are patients who have tumors that are driven by single changes in the genes. And I'll just make a very quick point here because many of my patients uh, don't understand the difference between changes in the genes in the cancer and changes in the genes that they pass down to their children. And when we talk about these mutations in the genes, they're very worried that their children are going to catch these cancers. So these are changes in the cancers. They are not changes in the genes that you got from your mom and dad and that you pass down to your children. So you must not worry about that. These are changes in the genes of the cancer. And we now have drugs for some of these that we can target with extraordinary precision and very much higher response rates than we see when we just give our chemotherapy poisons to everyone and it's not personalized. It's just a universal treatment that we apply based a little bit on the subtype of cancer, but mainly just, you know, let's just kill everything in our path. And that sometimes includes the normal cells and that leads to toxicity. So I think the technology is well, what I, has changed most. So can I pick up on that technology change then, which is, and you really described how the technology has changed the diagnostics and the, the diagnostics. The, the, um, what's the next step in the technology in, of diagnostics? Do you think is it is it you mentioned blood tests? Is it going to be breath tests, urine tests, poop tests? Is it better X-ray machines? Someone contacted me this week about a, a new bedside X-ray technology. Uh, what where do you think the technology is going to take us? Oh, you know, I don't think that breath tests um, are really that close to being on the horizon. I know there are some um, institutions that are studying it and some companies that are developing these tests and companies in particular, I think in Israel, that are developing these tests. But I'm not so sure that they are really there on the horizon in real time uh, at the present time. Okay. Um, you asked about the poop. Um, <laughs> I don't think that we're going to be That's testing- Just in case my kids are listening, the they won't be um, although, although people are looking at, um, at, at fecal material and the bacterial makeup of the fecal material, as it may relate to response to immunotherapy, but it's not going to be a screening test. We're not all going to be taking in our samples of poop. My mother would kill me if she knew I was using this word, um, but we're not going to be collecting fecal samples and screening for cancer that way uh, for lung cancer. On that topic though, and this probably isn't the topic for today, but 
some of the most important studies that have been done in the last decade have been the screening studies. And the largest screening study that was done in North America showed unequivocally that with CT screening, we can detect lung cancer early, we can detect it at a curable stage, and we can save lives. Having said that, where are we in Canada with implementing screening? We have screening for breast cancer, we have screening for uh, prostate cancer, we have screening for cervix cancer, but I don't think any province, certainly my own province, has not implemented a screening project yet. Well, they have projects, but not broadly applicable. It's, it's, it's expensive, but it is cost effective. Why is it cost effective for lung cancer? Because we have a target. We are not screening every man, woman, and child for lung cancer. We have target populations, smokers. We have target age groups. And so it's, it, it, it serves actually probably to be much more cost-effective than mammography is. Right. So where are we and when is it going to come? Sooner rather than later, I hope. Right, and here in Ontario, there's a pilot program in a few centers, um, including yes. here in Ottawa. But um, you know, pretty... that's been going on for quite some time now. It has. Quite some yeah. time, and we haven't really heard about it moving forward to being Correct. implemented on a broader scale across our province or in other provinces. Correct. Well, so British Columbia is the one province that's made an announcement um, that they'll be implementing their screening program next year in 2022. So they're the first one to drop really, but as you say, there's no province as yet that has it up and running. So hopefully others will follow British Columbia. Um, can I go back to a little bit about the diagnostics? We, we touched on the, the breath and the, the word that your, your mom doesn't want you to use. Um, what about blood tests though? I mean, we, um, what about blood tests to, we know that blood tests can detect some of these mutations that you talked about as cancer cells, some cells naturally die and release their genetic material into the blood and the technology is there now to detect that. But it, it's um, in most cancer centers, uh, in Canada at least, that's not something that is routine that someone can just go and do. What, do, do you, where do you see the blood biopsy going? So um, I'm not 100% sure, even with the technology that we have now, that we will be able to count on blood tests as a screening because to find mutations and cancer cells in the blood, you have to be shedding those cancer cells into the blood and they have to be breaking down, releasing their DNA into the blood to be able to find them. When you look at who sheds into the blood, it's more frequently in patients with a fairly high tumor burden. And even for the one blood test that we do routinely, which is looking for the resistance mutation in the subgroup of patients with EGFR mutations, we often cannot find the resistance mutation in the blood when we look for it. And we often can't find the primary driver mutation in the blood when we look for it. And that relates to the burden of disease. In patients whose livers are full and bones are full, we will find it. So if in patients with stage four disease, we can't always find the mutation, just think how unlikely it is going to be to be able to find blood changes on a routine basis in early stage disease or in screening. So we want a test that can pick up a cancer at a curable time, not when they're shedding the DNA into the blood with stage four. 
So at the moment, I don't think our tests are sensitive enough. Will they be? Would I ever have dreamed 20 years ago that we would be doing molecular tests on the blood 20 years ago? No. Will it improve in the future? Maybe, but you know, that's prophecy and not science at this point. And I'm not here with a crystal ball. I can basically tell you where we are. So I think the screening for the present time is not going to be blood tests, although we are doing studies in parallel, looking at blood. Um, but I think really it's left to the CT screening. We've done chest x-ray screening for years and chest x-ray is insensitive. So it really is the CT screening test. Okay. Um, I've got your crystal balls right here. Okay. Uh, right. I'll send one in the mail. Um, so um, you mentioned uh, EGFR lung cancer there and um, that uh, the EGFR mutations can sometimes be picked up in the blood test. And, and we had a whole webinar on EGFR lung cancer and we had another one on the ALK lung cancer. So those are the two most common molecularly oncogenic driven lung cancers that we, we talk about, but there are others. And what other um, targeted subtypes of lung cancer do you see that are on the horizon and that we might be able to um, treat more effectively in the next 12 to 24 months? So there are many that have really crossed over the horizon. Um, and are well recognized and known mutations. In addition to EGFR and ALK, of course, the next one is the other fusion mutation, ROS1. Mm -hmm. And we have treatments for ROS1. We have excellent oral molecularly targeted TKIs for ROS1. There's a rather unusual mutation of MET, exon 14 skipping mutations in MET. Mm -hmm. And we have known treatments for that. And the, the ALK and the ROS1 and the MET treatments often to a certain extent overlap. Some of the same drugs are active against those mutations. And so we have approved treatments for those. And we're talking here, so EGFR is around 12 to 15% of lung cancers, varies a bit by geography. ALK yes. is 3 to 5%. ROS1 yes. is... What, 1%? For all the others, we're getting down into about the 1%, one or 2% one rate. 1% or 2% for the MET Exxon 14. Um, and the, and no, sorry, you, I interrupted you. You were going to tell us some others. So I, I, I was going to say there are other fusions. There are NTREC fusions and NRG fusions. They're all at the very low levels, but there are treatments coming along for all of those. Um, also in the EGFR pathway, the ERB2 uh, gene is mutated in lung cancer. Now, ERB2 is a, a gene that is highly expressed in breast cancer. And we have had treatments directed against ERB2 in breast cancer for years, if not decades now. And in particular, the monoclonal antibody uh, Herceptin is really, really active uh, and has moved right up into the adjuvant setting for breast cancer. But basically, that gene is overexpressed or amplified more, more, many more copies of the gene in breast cancer. In lung cancer, it's more that there are mutations, little changes in the structure of the gene as opposed to ex expression level. And we don't have any approved treatments for ERB2 that are paid for in Canada, although we have been evaluating numerous breast cancer treatments. So the monoclonal antibodies against ERB2 are being evaluated and are active. And there are new targeted oral agents such as posiotinib that's being evaluated and they are active too. So we will be seeing approvals for many of these yeah. drugs, but remember approval doesn't equate to 
reimbursement and payment. So uh, that always lags behind. And here's a problem. Here's a big problem. When you have a 1% gene, the big question is, should we approve? So that means the drug company can come and sell it. The drug without randomized data, comparing it to the standard of care up until that point. With these very small 1% genes, we are now seeing more and more approvals based on phase two single arm data that doesn't compare to a control. It's harder to get the approval for reimbursement within our healthcare system in Canada for these agents without randomized data. And this is something where uh, Lung Cancer Canada is really taking an enormous leadership role and really, you know, I was going to say attacking or fighting with or lobbying, let's say, um, healthcare, uh, the government and the healthcare jurisdictions to approve for reimbursement the payment based on single agent data because we may never get randomized trials. Right, on that point, and, and maybe I could just jump in, there's, there's just been a couple of comments that have come through in the chat, just uh, for people who are new to lung cancer language. We're, we're talking right now, Dr. Shep is talking about subtypes of lung cancer um, that, we've, that, that science is now identifying, um, but it's only sort of 1% of lung cancer patients might have this subtype or 1% have a different subtype, and there are drugs that are being developed for them. And... Um, if you've got a notepad out, jot them down, but we, you or go back and look. But your oncologists should be now able to check for these various subtypes, and we've we're, we're listing them off, and they're just sort of letters and numbers: EGFR, ALK, ROS1, and then others that Dr. Shepherd's mentioned that are coming: uh, RET, MET, NTRK, NRG. Herb B2, or sometimes known as HER2, H-E-R2. So there's all of these subtypes are coming, which is very exciting because all of these treatments can be really effective, but when they're really uncommon and there's only a few uh, patients in Canada who have that disease, that subtype, it's difficult to get a lot of evidence to, to take to the regulators, which is, which is what we were just talking about with um, where Lung Cancer Canada is really trying to advocate for for um, approval. And in fact, for ROS1, the ROS1 subtype that you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, um, we've been successful there. And yeah. the, the ROS1 drug, crizotinib, um, has just really was just approved in 2020. And most provinces now have, have access to that. Um, indeed, I just prescribed that uh, yesterday for a ROS1 patient. Um, so that just to provide some of the context. Now, you so also I, mentioned- I Just before we get off yeah. the mutations, um, I think there is one other mutation that I was leaving for the last, which is KRAS. Right. And KRAS was one of the very first mutations we ever knew about in lung cancer. And we've been studying it for years and decades, literally decades. And basically we thought it was a prognostic marker. Uh, and it was associated what, what with- What do you mean worse, by that? Uh... That, means, that means it's associated with worse outcomes. So if you take all other things being equal, age and sex and stage of the cancer, you do worse if you have a KRAS mutation in your cancer than you do if you are KRAS wild type. So we've been trying to target KRAS for years and one of my colleagues, Dr. Lael, once said it's the untargetable target, but no longer, no longer. We now have KRAS targets, which are looking very promising. And this is important for us because KRAS isn't a 1% mutation. In adenocarcinoma, it's a 30% mutation. So this is an incredibly large number of, of patients who may benefit 
from KRAS targeted therapy. Now, studies are still ongoing. We don't have the results, but you're asking me to look into my crystal ball and I'm saying stay tuned for KRAS. That's a really important one for us because it's been so difficult to target, but yet it's present in such a large proportion of lung cancer. So stay tuned for KRAS. Right, and I think most, uh, well, I, I'm not sure this is a fair statement, but many of the larger academic cancer centers in Canada will be opening or have opened clinical studies for patients with KRAS lung cancer. Uh, we're about to open one in Ottawa. I'm, I'm sure you're going to have one yeah. at Princess Margaret Cancer Center. In fact, we've got a, a couple that are coming down the line here. So, so that's really a good question to ask uh, if you're in the clinic about KRAS mutations, because that that's not a 1%. That's, um, you know, if it's uh, you know, 10, 15, 20%, that's thousands of people across Canada. Yeah. Um, so we have to just have mind. a little bit more of a lecture on KRAS because all KRAS mutations are not created equal and there are different subtypes of KRAS mutations and they're, the KRAS mutations differ in colorectal cancer compared to lung cancer, et cetera. And at the moment, the only drugs that we have available for us are those targeting with the subtype of G12C. You don't have to remember that, of course, but that's just a sub subtype of, um, of, of KRAS mutation. So it's on codon 12 and a G to C sub, uh, substitution. So the majority of lung cancers are on codon 12, but they have various different point mutations on codon 12 and about 10% are on codon 13. So, so it's, it's very complex. KRAS is quite complex. And we only are targeting one, one subtype of KRAS at this time. But that still might be 10 to 12% of people. So it, absolutely, still, it's still, still a large number a lot of people. and will make an enormous difference. Um, and pharma and scientists are out there working on finding drugs that will target other mutations. Okay, let's let's move on to chapter three. If, if we say chapter one of what's coming is is the lung cancer screening, um, and chapter two is new targets in addition to the ones we've got, and we've gone. So, so Paul, we, chapter two is diagnostics. Diagnostics. The diagnostics are, are are complex to identify these mutations. Right, and, and then not the, every small hospital can do these complex tests. Um, and, and sometimes there, because of that, there are delays in making a treatment decision. You know, these tests are so complex, they, they really have to be centralized and specimens have to be sent out for testing. So is it pie in the sky to hope that in the next 10 years, every single hospital will be able to do these molecular tests and analyze for panels of hundreds of genes. I don't um, think that is pie in the sky. I don't Maybe think I, it is either. I think looking in my crystal ball, it will come, but so, not at the moment. So maybe I could direct people listening to this to our uh, Lung Cancer Voices podcast, which in fact, this will go into the podcast as well. And in one of our previous episodes, I spoke to Dr. Brandon Sheffield who is a, a pathologist um, at w the William Osler Health System in Brampton. And, and in, in that podcast, he talks about um, much more rapid molecular testing, which could potentially be available in uh, smaller hospitals and, and not just restricted to the academic centers. Um, can we move to immunotherapy? Um, so immunotherapy drugs have, um, have changed the lives of uh, countless lung cancer patients who are now living in some cases for years mm. after receiving what historically would have been a very poor, poor prognosis. Um, what do you see, um, what do you see um, in the next couple of years with immunotherapy? Are, are we, have we reached the plateau or have we got further to go? Oh, 
No, I, I doubt that we have reached the plateau. Um, we have identified one family of immunotherapy, the anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL-1 inhibitors, and they act by taking the brakes off the immune system. They allow the body's own immune system to um, contribute to attacking the cancer cells. And, and we know that we can, to a certain extent, identify patients who are more likely to respond based on their PD-L1 uh, expression on the cancer cells. So that has led to an incredible change in our treatment. There is now a subgroup of patients that we treat only with PDL1 inhibitors. There are subgroups of patients that we treat with PDL1 inhibitors added to chemotherapy. And these treatments really show meaningful benefit. We're not just prolonging by, you know, two months. We used to think two months was great. Now we're prolonging, not just for two months at the median, but by much greater improvements and long, long-term improvements that sometimes result in cures. We started looking at this in patients that were previously treated, the way we always introduce our new drugs. In the most advanced stages where we exhausted all the things we know work, and we found the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors work there. We then moved it into earlier stages and compared to chemotherapy in the second line setting. We compared to chemotherapy in the first line setting. We added to chemotherapy in the first line setting. And these drugs are now entrenched in our armamentarium. We've even gone as far as to hint at the word cure in advanced disease, but that's far from the majority of patients. However, as we've moved these agents into the earlier stages, we have added the word cure to our armamentarium. So when we add these agents in stage three after chemotherapy and radiation, we improve the cure rate, the cure rate. Cancer's gone, doesn't come back. And there are at least four very, very large global worldwide trials that have been done after surgery with PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors. Each of the major PD-1 and PDL1 inhibitors has been evaluated in large trials given after surgery. And the NCI Canada one, um, BR31, has close to accrual and we're just waiting for the results to roll in now. And all, I think all of the other studies, um, almost at least three of them have close to accrual now. And so crystal ball, let's look forward. It's probably going to be at least three years from now. So you're going to have to be a bit patient before there are any results. Could it be sooner if the results are really dramatic when the data and safety monitoring boards look at the data? It could be sooner. Remember EGFR, the adjuvant studies of osimertinib. Yeah. The, um, the data safety monitoring board closed that study down because the results were so dramatic. Will it be that way with the PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors? We can only hope, we right. can only hope. Yeah. But if not, we're looking at three or four years from now where these will become a routine after chemotherapy when indicated um, to change the cure rate. Okay. So that's um, exciting. And uh, maybe I'll just mention that um, probably in March, there'll be a What's New in Lung Cancer episode uh, just on immunotherapy. And our guests there will be Dr. Roz Jurgens from the Jurovinsky Cancer Center in Hamilton and Dr. Julie Bramer from Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. Um, so um, watch out for that one. Um, Dr. Bramer was uh, the, uh, the, the lead researcher on a number of the very um, earliest 
uh, immunotherapy study. So she really is a, an expert um, in that area. Um, so, so let's just talk a wee bit more about immunotherapy because we, what's going to come in the future, I think, will be maybe more tests. We need more tests that will predict which patients will benefit most from immunotherapy. We have the PDL1 immunohistochemistry, and that's a, now a routine test uh, for lung cancer in pathology departments. Will there be others? Will the poop come into play? Mm, I'm, you know, I'm not so sure about the poop, but um, I'm sure that we will be developing much more sophisticated testing to predict for response to immunotherapy. See who's going to do well? Yeah. And then the, the next thing is, you know, just you go back to TB. One drug worked, two are better, three are better, four are better. Combination therapy, and and that's the way we developed chemotherapy. We almost never use single agent chemotherapy, so we are looking at combinations of immunotherapy agents. We only have one that's been approved to date, and that's the PD-1 um, inhibitor. Um, and the CTLA and four uh, CTLA four inhibitors. So only one of those has been approved in Canada. Not to the best of my knowledge, reimbursed for dual therapy, right? Not yet, no. No. So approved, not reimbursed. So nivolumab, the PD one is uh, inhibitor, is approved, but the CTLA four inhibitor is not paid for yet. So. Yeah. So. Um... So with your crystal ball, then maybe a combination immunotherapy drugs coming um, and then um, the, the adjuvant setting. So for those not familiar with the word, the term adjuvant, that means for people who have been diagnosed with lung cancer at an early stage and have had surgery to remove the cancer and hopefully the surgery is a cure, um, an adjuvant therapy or an adjunct, an add-on is a course of treatment after the surgery to try and reduce the risk of recurrence. And Canada led one of the biggest studies that you mentioned there, the BR31 study. Um, so it may be that Canada will be, um, uh, maybe will win the race uh, to be the first to show that immunotherapy after surgery Im improves the cure rates. Um, and, and that would be uh, not the first time that Canada has led the way um, because Dr. Shepard, you, you've led a number of studies that led the way in various areas of adjuvant chemotherapy and other chemotherapies um, a few years ago. And so let's move on to chemotherapy. So we've talked now about screening. We've talked about diagnostics and testing and targeted to new targets, new subtypes of lung cancer, immunotherapy, maybe comb new combinations coming, um, early stage. Does this mean that chemotherapy has had its day and the curtains come down on the chemo era? No, I think chemotherapy is still going to be with us. Uh, remember that it is still a minority of patients who have a driver mutation and are eligible for molecularly targeted drugs or the oral pill therapy that everyone wants to have. That still remains the minority of our patients. Um, small cell lung cancer has no molecularly targeted treatment to date. The majority of squamous cancers still have no molecularly targeted treatment to date. And so for those subtypes, the, the mainstay of therapy remains chemotherapy. And, you know, we, we ended the immunotherapy part talking about moving it into the adjuvant setting where there is a cure rate. There is a cure rate. And at the moment, we are not abandoning chemotherapy. Chemotherapy remains the standard after surgery for stages 1B, 2, and 3 um, to improve the cure rate. We know even, even in stage one and two, only about half the patients are actually cured by their surgery alone because little tiny deposits have spread. We have no tests to find them. We have no scan, no PET scan. 
that will pick up these tiny little deposits. And that's why we give chemotherapy because the chemotherapy goes throughout the body and has the potential to kill those little tiny deposits. And with chemotherapy, we can improve the cure rate, cure rate by about an absolute of 10 to 15%. So chemotherapy is with us. It's curative in stage one and two and resected stage three. It adds to the cure in unresectable stage three when given with radiation. And it will still be with us for stage four, even when stage four is not considered curable, it still remains the backbone of treatment for most patients. And you're, you're being modest in that you didn't uh, tell us, but I'll tell everyone that actually Dr. Shepard who led the first trial internationally that proved chemotherapy improved cure rates um, after surgery. Um, so time is marching on and I know there's a lot of questions coming in. So we, I'm gonna pass this over to Christina in a moment to moderate the questions. But before that, I've just got one final question for you. Um, when we talk about drug treatments in general, we've got the targeted treatments, which are generally pills, the immunotherapy, chemo's here to stay. Um, I'm now seeing new classes of drugs emerge um, by specific antibodies, drug antibody conjugates, things, words that I struggle to understand. Um, do you see new, um, whole new realms of treatment opening up in the next, in the next little while? Well, potentially, yes. Um, the, the bi-specific antibodies, so antibodies um, are uh, sort of immune type treatments that are directed against some part of the cell. So if the cell expresses a protein A or protein B and the monoclonal antibodies that we have um, available to us, um, particularly for HER2, that's, that's a monoclonal antibody that attaches to uh, HER2 um, and that we're looking at in lung cancer, but is standard in breast cancer. So a bispecific monoclonal antibody will attach itself to two different parts of the cell. I'm not sure there are any of those that are ready for prime time at, at this moment. Um, the antibody drug conjugates are antibodies that attack a protein, something that's sitting out on the surface of the cell and can attract the antibody to attach to it. But if you have an antibody that kind of looks like this, attached to the antibody is what we call a warhead. And those warheads for the most part are chemotherapy. Um, so the antibody takes the chemotherapy and delivers it specifically to certain cells. And at the moment, I guess the one that's maybe looking somewhat favorable is the one that has an antibody against HER2 um, and has a campithecin type warhead attached to it. And that's looking a bit promising. Um, I think we haven't seen all the data, but it's looking as if it will be most promising in HER2 mutations and not HER2 amplified or overexpressed cells. So th they're coming, but once again, these uh, antibody drug conjugates, the drugs are chemotherapy. So it's just taking our two technologies and putting them together. Right. But we've you know already like been doing that. We've already been doing that by giving an antibody yeah. and chemotherapy. And there are examples of those drug antibody conjugates being very effective in some blood cancers and in breast cancer. Yes. I sometimes think of it as like a SWAT team and the truck is the antibody and it's driving the SWAT team right to where they're going to assault the bad guys. Um, and, uh, you know, why that's better than chemotherapy is the SWAT team is going only to the bad guys um, in and it's not, it's not, they're not just firing randomly around the streets like 
chemotherapy, which is more of a sort of dirty bomb. Um, and the bispecific antibodies, that one of the things I liked about those is um, they, they can, one, one arm of the antibody targets the mutation that we know about, and the other arm can target the mutation that might emerge if the cancer becomes resistant. And so you can kind of tackle what's in front of you, but also try and prevent what might be coming down the road. Um, so it, we'll have to see. Um, I think we've been given the hook here, Dr. Shepard. Um, yes, I think so. Christina is... Uh, <laughs> yes, she's come back on. Um, but I, I know there's a, a lot of questions for you. Um, so, Christina, we'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Wheatley Price, and thank you, Dr. Shepard, for this very fascinating and engaging discussion. I think we could have gone on for another hour, but uh, you can see that the questions were coming in fast and furious. I and see them, yes. Yeah, we have a lot of questions, um, actually, uh, on some of the technologies regarding lung cancer and really for with, with all stages of lung cancer. And just to quickly clarify, the first, when I, when I ask him the first question, there's been a lot of interest on screening. And could you just clarify very quickly what the target population is for screening? Uh, so the target population is smokers. And um, that's an obvious target. And I uh, God, I've forgotten the exact age group. I think it might have been over 50. Was it 50? Yeah, years so it, it's, uh, it, it varies a little bit by jurisdiction, but it, it, it's uh, 55 to 74. Um, in the US, they've actually started to expand that either way. There have been some discussions in Canada to expand or change the age range based on certain populations. For example, in... in um, in the Inuit population, where lung cancer occurs on average 10 years younger than in the rest of the Canadian population, but that's the age range. And you don't have to be a smoker right now, uh, just have to be a smoking history. Yes. Um, and actually Canadians, and well, you'll know this, Dr. Shepard, but Canadians have been amongst the leading researchers in this. And um, uh, Dr. Martin Tamamagi, who's in uh, St. Catharines, Ontario, has developed a whole model for um, trying to predict exactly that the most effective way to get a population to screen. If yes, screen and risk. He's, he's defining risks yeah. based on age and family history and smoking intensity and duration, etc. Mm -hmm. So yeah. he's really been at the forefront of this um, screening. So just a little bit in case you don't know what this screening is, it's a CT scan, a computed tomographic scan. And the technology for CT scans has increased dramatically. And the scan that's used in screening is what we call a low dose CT scan. And it's done without dye. So it, it's, um, it's not entirely sensitive uh, because it's done without dye but it is sensitive enough to pick out little tiny nodules that are just measured in millimeters. And there are all kinds of algorithms for if you have this kind of a nodule, you get your screen repeated in three months. If it's something else, it may be six months or a year, et cetera. Um, and there's a great learning curve for the diagnostic radiologists that have to um, interpret them. And the, the initial worry was false positives, but that, that can be reduced significantly with training and with algorithms for when to repeat the CT scans and what's a serious nodule or a concerning nodule, et cetera. The scan, the technology has increased so much that it takes longer to position the patients, get them dressed and undressed than it does to do the scan. The scan goes around in 12 seconds. That's the advance in the technology. It's quite amazing. So it, it is feasible, but you have to understand that CT scanners are, are expensive and you have to have them in hospital settings, et cetera. It's not like going to your family doctor for a pap smear. 
Yeah, and I would just encourage, and there's a lot of interest in screening, but I, I would just encourage everyone who is uh, interested in learning more about screening. We have a wonderful podcast uh, in the Vo Voices of Lung Cancer with Dr. Stephen Lamb. Please go check that out. We also have another podcast on what's practically happening in each of the provinces on screening with uh, CPAC, and that uh, has uh, also come recently dropped as a podcast as well. So I really encourage you to check those out. Just continuing on with the level of screening and I know that we don't have a lot of time left so I would ask that um, I'm going to take Dr. Wheatley Price's uh, hosting privileges away I'm going to place him on the panel as he is an esteemed medical oncologist in his own right and I would ask that I'm going to deliver these next set of questions rapid fire and ask that you give no more than um, 30 seconds to a minute on your answers. So in continuing on with the, the, uh, the, there's a lot of interest in technology, but, and uh, certainly in early diagnosis. So if somebody is er diagnosed early and um, they are considered cure, instead of scans, what are emerging technologies to help with uh, monitoring? Is it just scans at this moment and the others are not uh, ready for prime time yet? Oh, in two seconds, basically for us, it's, it's, um, uh, x-rays and CT scans. Yeah, same for us. But just, I think, remember that from Dr. Shepard's comment just a moment ago, that the, the progress in the technology of the scans themselves has been phenomenal. So a CT scan of the chest now, the radiation exposure is tiny. Um, and so, you know, we used to worry that repeated CT scans in follow-up could put people at risk. But, but actually, the the, the, the dose of radiation from a CT of the chest is is inconsequential really now. I, I certainly agree with that, but you have to remember that when we do the follow-up with a low-dose CT scan, that ignores the fact that most lung cancers probably won't come back in the chest. They may come back in the liver or the adrenal glands or the bones or sadly even the brain. And we just, uh, there's no cost-effective way to do an MRI and full CT scanning with dye on uh, as routine follow-up. So there's a lot, there was a question also on follow-up and I will dilute, direct that one to Dr. Wheatley Price. And so as patients are becoming uh, living longer with lung cancer, they are worried about uh, some of the radiation that they are, can get. Are there certain things that you maybe certain different types of routines or different sorts of follow-ups or techniques that technologies that can be utilized that so mean, that means that uh, patients are not getting scans as often? You know, I'm, I'm not sure there are quite yet, other than the comment that scans are getting a little bit easier to do. We're not really moving yet to other scanning modalities as surveillance without radiation. So for example, MRI scans or ultrasound scans uh, are not routine in practice uh, right now. There is some research uh, going on it with blood tests um, to see if a blood test might be able to um, detect um, a recurrence before a scan. Um, now, whether that goes on to the point that if you have a negative blood test, you don't need the scan, I'm not sure where we're at that point yet. So I think to be to be honest with everyone, I think scans are part of the surveillance for the foreseeable future. I think the benefit probably outweighs the risk of the radiation exposure as the radiation exposure has gotten less and less. I will make one point though, that 80% of lung cancers are still in smokers. Now, many of those are former smokers uh, the risk of lung cancer doesn't approach that of a lifetime non-smoker until about 15 years after stopping. But there are some patients who continue to smoke. And, you know, this has to be, getting lung cancer has to be a teachable moment because the risk of getting second cancers is much higher in those who continue to smoke. So it's not to castigate or cast aspersions on smokers. It's just to make a recommendation for health that stopping smoking is the best thing you can do. So I'm gonna pivot now to non-smokers and I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Shepard is that uh, recently there's been um, observed uh, and documented rises in uh, uh, cases of lung cancer in non-smoking women. Any comments or thoughts on that? Yes, um, 
I, I'm not sure I have a good answer as to why there have been, particularly in China, there have been some suggestions about the way cooking is done and the cooking oils and things. I don't know that we fully understand this. It doesn't appear to be associated with contraception and birth control pill, because you remember that has also come in, it's certainly in my era. Um, and you know, 60 or 70 years ago, women weren't taking the birth control pill until they were 50 and then hormone replacement therapy after that. Women just weren't bombarded with hormones, but to the best of our ability to tell, it doesn't seem to be associated with hormones. What we do know though, is that in the lifetime non-smokers, those are the patients, and they are more women than men, probably two to one, uh, uh, two women for every one man uh, in, in non-smokers. And they are often the ones that will have these driver mutations. 60 to 80% of the non-smokers who have lung cancer have the targetable driver mutation. So that's the good side of it. The downside is it doesn't seem fair to get lung cancer if you're a non-smoker, but the good side is that we have many more targeted therapies for them. Okay, so now we're at uh, 4.55 and there's still a ton of questions. So I am going to deliver this rapid, rapid fire and ask you guys to keep your answers to 15 to 30 seconds. Okay. Um, <laughs> the next one is absolutely easy. Is it, uh, uh, and I'm gonna target it back to Dr. Wheatley Price. Is it possible to have two driver mutations? Uh, yes, but vanishingly rare. Um, there you go. Perfect. And, um, and we're going to look really forward into the future and, uh, and say, what about uh, vaccines? Vaccines for lung cancer? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of interest in the Cuban vaccine. Right. So the Cuban vaccine uh, was this EGFR uh, vaccine, uh, which um, made a splash, uh, oh gosh, 10, 15 years ago, probably. And then... Um, uh, resurfaced with some studies in, uh, I think in Buffalo. Um, I haven't seen any results of that. There were some, there was uh, some vaccine studies, um, in fact, also uh, with some good Canadian leadership from Dr. Charlie Butts um, out in Alberta. Um, they were looking to see if you could improve the cure rate of stage three lung cancer with a vaccine after this regular chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, they were marginally better in some studies and not better at all in others. And then immunotherapy uh, came along and, and sort of blew it out of the water. So um, not quite there yet. Not quite there yet. Not quite there yet. So the, the Cuban vaccine really hasn't been evaluated properly. We haven't seen results in randomized trials. There was a big to do based on phase two data that overinterpreted all those results. Okay, so Dr. Shepard, uh, when we talk about things that have happened in, 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 in other cancers, um, what about CAR-T that's uh, being shown in, uh, to have results in other cancers? Oh, CAR-T is extremely complex. I don't think it's going to be ready for prime time in lung cancer in the foreseeable future. That's okay. a question to come back to though. Sign in for the one with Dr. Bremer um, and we'll ask, we'll ask Dr. Bremer about CAR-T. Excellent. So I'm going to direct my last question um, in, in, on, on another vaccine question. And, and we've been getting a lot of questions in the chat. I, I just want to give a, a little bit of um, um, acknowledgement there that there is a lot of anxiety about lung cancer patients getting the vaccine, whether they were uh, targeted for trial. Just wanted to give, get both of your thoughts on that just briefly. Just to clarify, we're talking about the COVID vaccine. Now. COVID vaccine, yeah, right. yes. Yes, so, um, well, I, I would say that, you know, lung cancer patients are at higher risk of uh, complications for coronavirus than, um, than other cancer patients. Um, in many cases, lung cancer is higher, higher risk. Lung cancer typically is in, a, a, or more commonly in an over 65 age group population, another risk factor for um, COVID. So, um, uh, we, as at our cancer center, are encouraging all our lung cancer patients to receive the coronavirus vaccine when it is offered to you. Um, we, um, the trials 
did not, however, include cancer patients who were on chemotherapy or immunotherapy. The, the Pfizer, the Moderna, the AstraZeneca vaccine studies did not include that. So we don't know for sure. We're waiting for to learn more. But extrapolating from some other vaccines like the flu shot, um, there are some similarities that would really suggest that it is likely going to be very safe and a good thing to do. Um, if you are on treatment, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, a targeted therapy, um, and then you get offered the vaccine, do speak to your oncologist or your cancer team about the optimal timing to do that. But I think largely this is something that we're going to be recommending uh, almost across the board. Um, Dr. Shepard, what, what's yeah, happening? Yeah, I, th I think we're going to be recommending it. We don't know if patients are on chemotherapy, will that blunt their response? We don't know if they're on immunotherapy. Remember, immunotherapy takes the breaks off the immune response. So will they get an augmented response, which could be a good thing or could result in more side effects? We have virtually no idea. Um, I've had a few patients with, uh, with COVID-19 now. And as one of our nurses said, we're flying the plane as we're learning how to build it. And with that said, I would like to um, just add that, you know, there's a couple of questions asked about advocacy. And um, for those that are interested in advocating for this, please reach out to Lung Cancer Canada directly. I can say from, from um, just a very brief comments, Lung Cancer Canada has been working with the All Cancer Group in order to put out some statements. We've written the um, federal and the provincial government uh, of all the provinces. And we've just uh, worked collaboratively with the Canadian Thoracic Society to put out some statements as well as advocacy to the different uh, jurisdictions on uh, the place of uh, the COVID vaccine with those with uh, thoracic illnesses. And so if you are interested in advocating, interested in what we're doing on this front, please reach out to Lung Cancer Canada uh, and we will uh, get you involved. So advocate right now for reimbursement for adjuvant osimertinib for EGFR mutated lung cancer after surgery. That's the first thing to advocate for right now. And I will say that advocacy does work because I will thank all everyone who helped us to advocate for Crizotinib for ROS1. And um, that is now covered in all the province with the exception of PEI. So having said that, I will thank um, our panelists and our host, Dr. Paul Wigan Price and Dr. Shepard for the time they spent with us today. We could have gone on for another hour and there are lots of questions that we have not got around to, but thank you so much for your time. And if I were to make a couple of uh, state announcements, please, for the, you can, as you've heard from Dr. Uh, Wheatley Price, as well as Dr. Shepard, advocacy is very, very important. So join us at Hope Army and um, help us increase the voices of those that are living with hope um, with lung cancer. We do, and, and not only do you, uh, increase the voices, but increase the visibility. We have a Hope Army t-shirt that was designed by um, a lung cancer pa uh, patient along with his son-in-law. That is now the, the, uh, the official t-shirt for Lung Cancer Canada in 2021. So it can be ordered off the Lung Cancer Canada website. Please um, go on there and order, order that uh, t-shirt and wear it and help us increase the visibility of this cancer. And please do join us the next time for our next webinar, which is actually happening right after the Canadian Lung Cancer Conference. This is the largest lung, uh, Canadian lung cancer ca uh, uh, conference, and it is going to be on Wednesday, February the 17th, and it will be very specific to happenings in Canada and what is going on here today. So with that, I um, conclude this webinar. I wish everybody a good evening, and I'd like to thank all the patients and the caregivers that continue to give Lung Cancer Canada your trust in us. Thank you, and have a good evening. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. You're welcome. You, Thanks Shepherd. for having me.